Hello, Edu Magicians. Welcome to the Edu Magic Podcast with your host, Dr. Sam Fesich. Dr. Sam is a professor of education, author of Edu Magic, and a pumpkin spice latte fan. This podcast is designed for pre service teachers. Remember, friends, teaching doesn't begin at graduation, but during that first class at 8 a.m. Let's get this party started. Hi, I'm Steve Maletto from the Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hello, friends, and welcome back to another episode of the Edgy Magic Podcast. My name is Dr. Sam Fesich, and today I'm joined with Robert Koplinski. He is a math teacher, and he is the co-founder of Open Middle, along with the creator of Observe Me. And we just discussed before we uh, hit record, Grassroots Workshop, which sounds amazing. So we have a lot to talk about today. Robert, thank you so much for joining me, and welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Sam. Awesome. So, Robert, can you please tell my listeners now we're it's usually a future teacher, student teacher type audience. Can you tell us a little bit about your teaching journey or what got you into the field of education and what you're doing today? Yeah, you know, I I really had no intention of being a teacher at first. Uh, I was a programmer uh, back when uh, websites were going to make everyone billionaires. And uh, guess what? That didn't happen. We had an economy kind of crashed in around 2000. And I was unemployed. And I had loved teaching, but just I didn't think I wanted to be a teacher myself. But um, I wound up getting a in California, there was such a shortage for math teachers that I got an emergency credential. And I was really I was the third teacher of the year. They literally fired someone in the middle of the school year to hire me on St. Patrick's Day of 2003. And I didn't know what I was doing. I had never taken an education class in my life. I had never done a, a minute of student teaching. Like I was flying by the seat of my pants and I was not great. I loved the children, but I, I, I had no business being there. Uh, but, you know, eventually I kind of started to realize I really enjoyed it and that this could be something I wanted to do long term. And eventually I got my act together, got my credential. And um, that's kind of where I come to, I guess. So that led you on a 15 year journey in education. And from that, you have created so much, um, I don't know if disruption is the right word, but movement in education for sure, especially with the Observe Me movement. Can you share a little bit about how that came to be, what it is, and yeah, just all the things about the Observe Me movement? Yeah, I I guess maybe kind of connecting it back to just what what drives me uh, and what I would recommend for, for teachers who are just starting out on this journey is I guess you really have two paths you can go on and you can possibly combine them. One is what were the things that you loved about being a student that you want to give to other students? And the other one is like, what did you really, really not like? And you never want students to have to do that again. And, and I, and I think I had equal measures of it. Like I, I come from math education. I, I was what I came to realize a math robot. I could do math but I didn't have a damn clue what it was I was actually doing. I got correct answers to questions I did not understand. And I would say that just in general, I see things that frustrate me and I try to think of what are the solutions to them. Now, I should also add that about eight years into my teaching uh, journey, I became a teacher specialist uh, for my school district, which was Downey Unified School District in Southern California. And that was one of the most amazing experiences. I mean, really, that was a pivotal experience in my life. And specifically, I got paid to observe other teachers. And sometimes people might think like, oh, I'm there to tell people what to do. But like, damn, like there were amazing teachers. I was like, I am getting paid to learn from you. Like, this is awesome. And you would, you would just learn so many things. And I mean, I think we do this in our student teaching, right? But somehow, once you become a teacher, like you're just trying to survive. And it's, hard. It's hard for everybody. But what gets a back seat in this car is, I guess, really either having someone observe you and give them and give you feedback or observing someone else and giving them feedback because both ends of that interaction are very valuable. And so the observe me movement uh, and kind of what, I mean, it's crazy to even call it a movement. uh, But if you are on social media, 
if you look for the hashtag observe me, O-B-S-E-R-V-E-M-E, -E -E, uh, what you'll find is that educators are sharing uh, signs that basically invite people into their classroom, uh, ask them for feedback in specific areas, and really just make, I would say, take observations back into the hands of the educators and not make it something that's done to you by someone with more power than you, like an administrator that you dread. Um, and really just make it something where you can just, I mean, like who knows more than the people that you're working with? Like you've got probably a, 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 any secondary school, like a thousand years of teaching experience in the school, right? Like the collective knowledge, if you could take the best practices from everyone in that school, you would have a teacher of the year. I don't care what state you're in. And so the point I want to kind of make here is that if, is that we're at a place in our culture where sometimes we, I don't know, I think that we're just scared of being judged. I mean, there's so much judgment of what teachers should be doing. And so really this, the, the idea came from a tweet that Heather Cohn had shared, which basically had a sign about someone who would welcome people in and wanted people to give him feedback. And I was like, it had gotten an, uh, an insane number of retweets and likes. And I was thinking like, why is anyone thinking this is remarkable? Like I knew it was remarkable, but how the hell did we get to the place in education where observing someone and asking to be observed was like, wow, this is crazy. What an idea. And I just realized like somehow we have to take this back. And I, I don't think I did much more than just try to attach a hashtag and then strategically time it for when we started back in school. But uh, people started making these signs and they started sharing it. And like soon it was not just mathematics, it was other subjects and then it was other countries. And then, I mean, thousands of people have done this now. And so I, I my hope is that it's, it's reinvigorating the idea that we can learn from each other and that observations don't have to be like penalties. They're something that we can do to really grow ourselves. I agree 100%. I love the idea of we are collectively, we have so much power and knowledge together and opening our doors to our colleagues to observe us can be a really powerful tool, especially for our first year teachers and our student teachers who get feedback probably every day from their mentor teacher and probably weekly from their supervisors. But how can we like harness that for all practicing teachers to have that collective knowledge and that that type of atmosphere where it's open open doors come and watch me do this i'd love feedback on on this specific topic. yeah i think that it's important to realize that it's a two-way street like it's not i'm an amazing teacher and you're not so you should come observe me it's also not you're an awful teacher so and i'm amazing so i will observe you and tell you all the things you're doing wrong it's really like like okay if you teach secondary math i'm sorry if you teach a secondary topic the same topic over and over again you'll totally get this next example like we suck first period, but by the fifth time we've taught it in fifth period, we're amazing because no one, it never goes well the first time you teach it. And it takes like many times to teach it, to get better. Now, here's the thing I want you to think about. Imagine if you had like 10 more sets of eyes and 10 more sets of ears in the classroom, you would get so much better feedback that maybe you'd actually be great by second or third period. And so that's really the whole point of Observe Me is that it's pretty damn hard to know what's going on in your class when it's just you. And it would be amazing if you had more people in your room to give you feedback on the things you specifically care about. So I think it's really important. One part that kind of gets lost in the game of telephone, that is social media, is writing the goals. For example, uh, you could say my goal is student engagement. But like, what kind of feedback are you expecting on that? Like, is kids sit, you know, sitting with their hands tight, you know, clasped tightly in front of them? I mean, that was amazing student engagement like 60 years ago. Uh, is that what we really want from student engagement now? Uh, another one that we'll see is like the yes or no question. Am I doing a good job of student engagement? I mean, what kind of feedback are you expecting? Like no one's going to be like, no, they're going to put yes, and it's not going to help you. And so the, the, the strategy I recommend is like with a how uh, question uh, and, and frame it in a growth mindset kind of way. Like how can I do a better job of engaging students? And it basically assumes that no matter where you are on your journey, there is a way to get better. It invites real specific feedback, not just like complimentary superficial feedback. And hopefully you'll get like meaningful results that you'll be like, wow, this was really worthwhile. 
So we kind of already went into this uh, tips, but I have some questions about, do you have any like more specific tips for either the person going in to observe someone else and specific tips for I don't, the observee? How do we want to phrase that for whoever the person is being observed? Like how are some ways that they, they can really get, I guess, the most bang for their buck when they come in to observe and whenever they're being observed? What are some strategies to help support that besides, you know, building a positive relationship with the person who's going to observe you? I think that'd be helpful. But also what are some ways that they can have a really meaningful observation and then have time for that feedback? All right, I got I got something great for you here. So I've I've me. been fortunate in eight years of being a, a teacher specialist to have done quite a few observations and been on both ends. So let's start with uh, what can the person who is doing the observation? So you are watching a teacher. What tip would I give for you? So the first one comes from John Gottman, who did a lot of research on uh, marriage relationships, and he observed that he could kind of predict which marriages would last and which marriages would fail. And what is really important to realize here is that um, as much as it is about you giving this teacher feedback, it's really about a relationship of trust that you're building between you two. And yeah, you could say like, you suck here and you suck here and you suck here. But like at some point they're going to be like, I don't really want to invite that person back in anymore. And what John had, what, what John Gottman had realized was that, there's a specific ratio. It's not one to one. It's not two to one. It's actually five to one. That if the person, if there were more than five, one critique for every five sort of positive thing, the relationship was more likely to end in divorce than if it had been more in the positive. And I'll be really honest with you. Sometimes when I'm doing observations, I got five critiques for every compliment. And what I have come to realize is that a lot of this is on me. I think as humans, we take for granted uh, what we're doing right, and we focus overly on the things that we're not uh, doing what we wanted. And so what I mean is like, if kids are not sitting in rows, clasping their hands, something pretty awesome has happened, but we just have come to accept that it's normal. Like if kids are in small groups, if they're communicating and you know, have you know polite norms, if they're writing their thinking down. Like these are all things that we should acknowledge that you can easily say like, this is something I'm noticing. And what it also means then is that of all the things, of all the things that you really want to suggest as things that could get better, like what's the one that if you had to pick somewhere, pick that. Because if you're going to pick two things, then you need 10 positive things, which is hard. And so I have use this strategy to help me not be so nitpicky and to really focus on a single piece of meaningful feedback that will seem balanced by a lot of positive uh, reinforcement of things that are going great. I think that's really interesting. I, I really like that ratio and you can, and I think that helps college supervisors as well, not to be so nitpicky, but what's the one thing that that student can do better in their lesson or, or in the development or maybe even in the reflection, whenever that, that looks like, and then going back and, you know, thinking about what are, what are some of those positive things that that student did, or, you know, in this case, the current teacher, I think that's excellent. What about the person who is being observed? How are some, what are some tips that you have for that person? Yeah. So um, admittedly, this might be a little more math centered, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to frame it in a way that would be generic for all teachers. So I think that what happens often is that we talk about like what lesson we're going to use. We talk about uh, how we're going to do the lesson, maybe as a lesson plan, but we don't really talk about why we're doing the lesson. And, and I think it's worth considering the implications of that because I've noticed this as a pattern across uh, my years of, of teaching. So let me give you some possible whys and the downsides of not communicating that why. So sometimes, let's say you're being observed um, for a formal observation, you make this lesson plan, and then you feel like you've got to complete the entire lesson in that a lot of time. But like reality is, uh, that's hard to do. Like sometimes you don't really get that entire lesson to be finished in that period of time. And so what happens is that if you really want to complete that lesson in that period, you've got to make tough choices. Maybe there are some great conversations you could have had with students, but you kind of have to skip along because you got a clock to feed. Or maybe you want the kids to do more exploring, but you have to tell them more. Now, if you know that your goal is to complete the lesson, but your observer doesn't, the observer might be thinking like, what is wrong with this teacher? Like, does she not see all these opportunities for 
these great conversations? Does she just want to be a stage on the stage and not like a guide on the side? And I think simply communicating your why will help the observer understand what is happening. Another might be uh, introducing a new topic. Like maybe you're talking about uh, something that you're going to spend the whole unit on. So you're going to begin a, a, a lesson that you're being observed by talking about this topic that you will come back to repeatedly throughout this unit. Now, you know it doesn't matter if you finish a lesson because it's something that you're planning on revisiting throughout this whole unit. But the person who's observing you doesn't know that. So if they don't know that, they're like, what happened here? This teacher didn't even finish the lesson. Like, she started it. Like, did she lose her train of thought? Like, did she re realize not realize that the clock was running? Like, do you see how the miscommunication about why a problem is being used, why a lesson is being used can set up to these kind of misguided expectations from the observer? So that's really what I have observed. And let me be clear. I've been on both ends of this. I've been on, on the, where I'm doing the lesson where I'm like, I think I'm teacher of the freaking century. I'm having all these great conversations. Like it's like stand and deliver. Kids are like having these powerful moments, but guess what? The bell rings and I'm not done with the lesson. Now, from my point of view, the whole point of the lesson was me showing what powerful conversations can come up out of teaching this way. But from the observer, it's like, what the hell? Like you just taught this lesson. You didn't even finish it. Are you expecting me to finish this tomorrow? Like, and, and I get both sides of it. So it has been humbling. And that's why I think we all need to talk about why we're using the lessons that we're using when we're being observed. It's so important to focus on that why and be transparent with that, with your students, with the person observing you. Um, I think I think that can really be a powerful uh, thing to know about, especially when you're going in to do an observation or, or to be observed in this case. Now, we, we just like hit the tip of the iceberg with Observe Me. If my listeners want to go find out more, where do you want to direct them to? So if you just search Observe Me on uh, really Google or on Twitter or really almost any platform, you'll find something good. Uh, if you go on Twitter and you search for Observe Me as one word with a hashtag in front, uh, you'll see lots of tweets about people sharing uh, what they've done. If you search on Google, you'll find my blog post on it. I have a a blog post called Troubleshooting Observe Me, which I highly recommend you check out if you're planning on making your own sign as I'll help you craft your Observe Me goal. So it's not just like, I want feedback on student engagement. It's on, you can craft a question that really gets those people to uh, to give you the right feedback. And, and I take you through some of the most common issues that people experience. So that's how I would learn more about it. Thanks. And I'll make sure I put the link to that Troubleshooting Observe Me in our show notes so people can go directly to it. Great. Now, not only have you created um, the hashtag Observe Me, but you've also co-created Open Middle with Nanette Johnson. Can you share a little bit more about what this is and how we can use it as teachers? Yeah. So I think that a lot of times when I reflect back on my own experience as a math student, uh, I remember doing these like worksheets where, you know, you would do like 60 or 30 or 60 of the same kind of problem. And, you know, if you didn't know what you're doing, you just made the same mistake like 60 times. And if you didn't know what you're doing, it didn't necessarily feel like you were getting any better. It just felt like busy work that made your hand fall off and your eyes bleed. And I knew that when I was doing the same thing to my students, that that was not a good thing, but I didn't know what was better. And I'd always been looking for something that could replace that and kind of help build that procedural practice, but also uh, increase students' conceptual understanding. So they actually understand why things work. Uh, open middle problems. What I love about, I, I guess one thing that's worth exploring is the difference between open middle problems and open-ended problems. People say, I love open-ended problems, but sometimes the best problems have closed endings and open middle. So here's what I mean. Let's say I give you a math problem and you all begin with the same math problem. So that beginning is closed. You all start the same way. And let's say that there's exactly one right answer. The ending is closed. It's not like there's like a thousand different answers. What's interesting is when the middle is open, which means when there are many strategies you could use that are different to solve it, but you all get the same answer, you can have these really interesting conversations so that it's like, wait, you added and you got that answer and then someone else multiplied and someone else made a function. And so you could have really good conversations about how the strategies are connected and you can develop this deeper understanding. And so open middle problems, uh, they tend to have a certain format where people uh, or students are filling in, uh, placing digits in a box. Uh, but if you go to openmiddle.com, 
uh, there's a link, a button to download our favorite problem from each grade level from kindergarten through calculus. So you can really see immediately like what this might look like for you. I, lo I was just going to ask, where can we go to find more? This sounds so interesting and a great resource for our future teachers that are listening today. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, 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 I'm biased, but I, I think it's, uh, it's my single biggest bang for buck uh, thing that we could do in education. Like it will give you, I mean, if you go, actually, here's something for you to do. If you're on Twitter, look up the hashtag Y open middle, W-H-Y-O-P-E-N-M-I-D-D-L-E. You will find tweets of people saying like the kids persevered like I've never seen them before. They loved it. Uh, they kept asking for more. And it's crazy. It's from, you know, you got second grade teachers and calculus teachers all saying the same thing, that their kids love these and they've never seen such great thinking coming out of it. That's incredible. I'm going to share that with my future math teachers uh, that I teach. So I think that's, that's a great resource for them. Thank you. That's, that's wonderful. Now, uh, we talked about Observe Me. We talked about Open Middle. But there's also another thing here, grassroots workshops. And I just we just talked briefly about this before we hit the record button. But can you share what exactly this is, how we can get involved, all the things grassroots workshops? What I want people to understand is that traditional professional development fundamentally does not meet our needs. But yet we've, we're so accustomed to it that we just take it for granted. Like, let's, let's think about some of the major options. You got conferences. Conferences uh, are, have been great for a long time in the sense that you can see like top level speakers uh, and you can choose whatever you want. But the reality is like, how often are you going to hear something in 60 minutes that you're now fully prepared to implement in your classroom? They're, they could cost thousands of dollars. I mean, uh, and let's just put aside all the issues with potential travel and, you know, staying healthy. Uh, and you have to miss, you know, extended time with your classroom, with, with your students. Uh, other options include uh, your school district will bring someone in to speak to you, but now you've got to necessarily meet your, uh, leave your classroom. Uh, you didn't choose who you wanted to learn from or what you wanted to learn on. And you've got to somehow figure out how do you make this work? What we wanted to do with grassroots workshops is re-envision what professional development could be. We wanted you to be able to choose uh, to learn from the people that you know, like, and trust so that you can learn wherever you want, from, from wherever you want, whatever you want, whenever you want, so that you had professional development that met your needs and not the way around. So we're really trying to find like the people in, in all realms of education and then give you these flexible online workshops that uh, last for six weeks, but then you have access to them for 10 additional weeks. So you've got access to the content for four months. So you've got, uh, it's an affordable way to kind of learn a little bit, then try it out in your classroom, then come back with questions. And it really, the hope is that it will really meet your needs much better than existing options. That sounds like another game changer in education. You were talking about open middle being open uh, middle questions being a game changer for students. I think this is a game changer for teachers. What inspired this idea besides the, you know, we have all these traditional methods of uh, professional development. Is there anything else that inspired this idea? I felt like teachers did not have enough control over their own professional learning. Like you, you had really limited options. Like, and, and, and consider this, like, if you live in a place where it's not like a major city, there aren't conferences coming to where you live. And, you know, you may not be able to get that speaker that you want to come there. So then you just don't have access to high quality professional development. And that inequity, that just sucks. Like that should not be a thing. So to be able to learn what you want, when you want, and, and not really have to be burdened by it's too expensive or we can't fly out of state or no one's going to come to us, but that you could actually learn what you want. I just felt like there was a gap. And, um, you know, I don't know that I can stop global warming on my own, but the, the mission I keep thinking about is if we can train teachers to make like highly, highly educated children across the world, like that's a great thing. That's at least something I can do to help uh, our own future. I think that's an incredible mission. And I love that you're so passionate about it. 
Robert, we've talked about, let me recap here. We talked about observing. We talked about open middle questions. We talked about grassroots workshops. This, this is such an incredible interview. What advice do you have for the future math teachers that are listening out there? The teachers who are maybe going into student teaching next year, next semester, or maybe those starting their first field experience in a math classroom, or maybe there's a freshman out there that's just starting their, um, their journey into being a math teacher. What advice do you have for one of those listeners uh, today? So I was a math major at UCLA. Uh, when I graduated, I knew everything about math. And what I've come to realize is that every day was another step closer to realizing I don't know anything about mathematics. And it's really, it, you know, it's a hard, you, you kind of go through these phases, right? First is denial. Like, uh, if I don't know it, then probably it's not important. And then it's like, wait, if I don't know how to do that, does that, what does that mean? Does that mean I actually don't know how to actually do this math? And then you start to realize that when you start learning why some things work in math, you start to scare realization of like, oh crap, like if I don't know this, could there be other things I don't know? And then the more things that you learn, the more you realize, oh my gosh, there's so much I can do, but don't actually know how to do. And what I want you to realize is you're a hundred percent normal if you feel that way. Everyone feels that way. And honestly, I, I've, I've come to find this as true in, in a lot of aspects in life. It's that the more that you learn, the more you realize you don't know. And that as awkward as that feels, I, I, think that, uh, I think that you just need to embrace that. The other thing I would say is I have a blog post called, I hope you're embarrassed. And it's tongue in cheek, but I, I really mean it. And what I mean is this, like I am mortified by how I taught in my first three years. Like I would totally fire me if I could go back in time and see me in my first three years. Like I meant well, but I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And I'm embarrassed. But what I realized also is I'm thrilled that I'm embarrassed because if I was still teaching the same way, I wouldn't be embarrassed. So when you look back at what you were doing and you're embarrassed, that is wonderful because it means absolutely you have gotten better. So my strange blessing for all of you is I hope you're as embarrassed as often as possible because it absolutely means that you're improving. And it's a weird kind of thing to think about, but I, I wish you great improvement and realize that we all struggle the same ways with kind of feeling of imposterness. We, we absolutely do. I just read a tweet on Twitter this morning about a student teacher saying, you know, imposter syndrome is real. I feel like, you know, I have all this education, but I still feel like a fraud in the classroom. And I think that goes along with what you were saying about the smarter you get, the more information you know, the more you realize you don't know. And that's okay. Very much. And, and it doesn't matter if you don't teach math. It's the same in every single subject. We have to be, I really thought when I first started teaching, I could just teach the same grade for long enough and coast for the rest of my career. And I mean, I'm not, I'm going to own it because I, I have to own my background, but it was a really naive thought at that point. And now I realize like I'm never going to stop learning. And that's just the way it is. It is just the way it is. Gradu or Learning doesn't start when you cross that stage of graduation. It just starts to begin then. And you start to learn more about who you are as a teacher, who you are for your students. It's an incredible journey. So, Robert, we're coming to the end of our conversation. And, you know, this is the Edgy Magic podcast. we got to talk a little bit of Edgy Magic, right? So is there an area that you'd like to share about? I'm thinking you might want to share a little bit about professional learning networks, you know, with the Observe Me movement or maybe using technology. I don't know. Where do you want to go from here? You know, I'm actually going to combine digital presence and kind of your professional learning network. Uh, I will say that life is changing faster than you can possibly imagine, that um, the honest, scary reality is that sometimes the books that you're reading now are almost on their way to being coming irrelevant, right? And the only way you can survive is to increase the capacity that you have to learn. Now, the also, the also reality is like you have to have life balance. Uh, you cannot just work endlessly. And I think that having, so when I joined Twitter, I learned more in my first year on Twitter than I had in my previous 10 years as an educator. Uh, you have people sharing their best ideas and then like the cream of the crop rises and that the same ideas keep getting retweeted, then you're probably like, I should check that out. And so you essentially have people crowdsourcing the best ideas so that instead of having to find out what's best, you can just like snip uh, from the fire hydrant, right, of all these ideas out there. So I find that 
um, I completely concur to you with you that you have to get a, a digital presence that you have to be online. Uh, you don't have to, be, you could be a lurker. You don't have to actually tweet. You could just kind of read what people are doing. Um, but you will get so many ideas and you will find that it actually saves so much time because your next great lesson, instead of having to spend an hour thinking of it, you'll find it online or you'll be able to ask like, Hey, what ideas do you have for teaching this topic? So I, I highly recommend that, especially if you're in math. Absolutely. And one of those cream of the crop ideas is the hashtag observe me. So definitely make sure we, we go and check that out. If you're driving, pause and you know, <laughs> and make sure you check it out when you get to, to type it out safely. But Robert, this has been an amazing conversation. I know my listeners are going to have to rewind this and listen to this again, but how can they find you online? Where can they go to connect with you and see all the awesome stuff that you are doing and the passion that you have for helping students and helping teachers all over the world? Yeah, thank you for asking. So you can find me on my website at robertkaplinski.com. That's K-A-P-L-I-N-S-K-Y.com. I'm also on social media at Robert Kaplinski. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more about Open Middle, that's openmiddle.com. And Grassroots Workshops is Grassroots Workshops, but both are plural, so they both end in an S. Um, so yeah, I, I'd love to connect with you and uh, let me know what you're thinking. Excellent. Thank you so much, Robert, for your time today. Thank you very much, Sam. All right, Edumagicians, to find out more about Robert and all the amazing work he's doing with the Observe Me movement, the open middle, and the workshops, you can head on over to the show notes and you'll see all that information there. But I want to tell you a little bit about the AAEE Candidate Portal. It is free for future teachers, and it's a game changer when it comes to helping you find your first job. So all you need to do is go to aaee.org slash join, and you'll be able to scroll down to the middle-ish part of that page and click Educator Candidate, and you can create a free account there. Once your account is approved, you'll be able to log in, and you can find information on interview tips and tricks, resume building, all access to their um, AAE webinars, scholarship opportunities, job fair calendar, and you can also find a report that talks about teacher supply and demand. So that's aaee.org slash join create a educator candidate account, and you can have access to all of these resource, resources for free. So make sure you check it out today. There you have it, Edu Magicians. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share it with your friends. For more Edu Magic, check out sfesich.com and follow Dr. Sam on Twitter and Instagram at sfesich. Until next time, you have the Edu Magic within you.